Hello again, folks. Hopefully we have no technical hitches tonight. Uh, like, unfortunately, like last night, Dr. Helen Fry was fraught with internet problems, but so far, so good for tonight. Well, we are continuing our build-up to D-Day um, week, and today it's all about the role of the Navy, both the British Navy, Royal Navy, the US Navy, Canadian Navy, and clearing that channel of those deadly mines to enable us to get a fleet of ships to Dida, to the beaches on June the 6th to make the invasion. So that's what we're going to be talking about. And I couldn't have found you a better expert to talk about it because basically it was his job for nearly 40 years in the Royal Navy. So joining me tonight, Nick Stanley. Good evening, Nick. How are you doing? Good evening, Paul. I'm good, thanks. And you? I'm very well. So, yeah, it's. I was just saying before we went live, um, I did a bit of prep and I picked up my generic D-Day books. And often, you know, the paragraph just says, and ahead of the invasion, the channel was swept for mines and this job was very important. And you look for an extra bit and that's about all there is. And you kind of think, is that it? And I checked quite a few books and it the same thing kept coming up. And uh, even in some books about the naval aspect, huge detail about LCIs, LCTs, the formation of the flotillas of the landing craft, and then the mine sweeping bit just seemed to get short shrift. So it's an important subject. So... Um, Thank you for coming on and talking about it. But tell us a little bit about how you know how you ended up in mine detection yourself in the Royal Navy. Was it something you wanted to do? Is it just you ended yeah. up that way? Yeah, it goes back mists of time. Uh, I joined the Navy in seven, 1977, and in uh, 1981, I decided to uh, try and try and qualify as a mine warfare and clearance diving officer. Uh, that's a nine-month course, uh, talking about mining, mine sweeping, mine hunting, uh, and a lot of it was clearance diving and bomb disposal as well. And that set me up for a series of appointments on minesweepers and mine hunters. Uh, took that through my career. Uh, that side of it culminated when I was the captain in charge of uh, all the Navy's mine hunters, minesweepers, and patrol vessels. Uh, I was, fortunately, I commanded a mine hunter, which was a huge privilege. Um, and then uh, later on in my career, uh, a different aspect of it really. I was uh, an attache in Paris, uh, going to a lot of the commemorations, uh, a lot, of, especially uh, military commemorations. But just the, the idea of uh, showing respect and honoring the memory of, of, of what people achieved during the war uh, grew within me. And uh, I just married the two together in terms of uh, my own professional expertise in mine warfare and diving, uh, my knowledge then of naval history and uh, my desire to sort of honour the memories of, uh, of those that um, achieved what they did during the war. So I, won, I run a Twitter account called Sweepers3945. Uh, that is a day-by-day -day account of what happens uh, during the war. We're, obviously, we're up to 1941 at the moment. Um, and then finally, in terms of a personal touch, uh, I'm a volunteer at the D-Day Story, which is just down the road from me here in Southsea. And my father-in-law served in Minesweepers as well uh, and uh, featured in some of these events. So the full package, basically. That we're, uh, the full we have asked for someone better to talk about it. And, you know, you're, you're, you're throwing words like mine sweeping and mine hunting. And I'm hoping during the course of the show you'll clarify what the difference is and, and what how these terms are used and how it all comes together. Because I think it's something that I realize in just looking at your PowerPoint, how little I know. And it's, a, it's wonderful on World War II TV to bring stories that we should know more about and for whatever reason you don't. And you, then you realize, why didn't I know about that before? It's not like this is an obscure, um, unimportant part of the war. This is a vital part of an operation that, as we know, we go into the presentation, some very important people said some very important things about minesweeping with regards to, 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 the, to, to the events of 1944. So yeah. it is a thing that it's been neglected for a long time. But we're going to put that right right now. So... Um, yeah, mind sweeping. So, you know, um, I'll hand over to you and in my own inimitable style, I will jump in when I think there's something to clarify or if we have a question from our lovely viewers. So um, over to you, Mr. Stanley. OK, well, I'll start. I'll start with this context on screen at the moment. And uh, uh, as you can see, they're sort of the archetypal images of, uh, of D-Day and Normandy. It's the starting point for where people tend to think about it, as, as you yourself have said, you know, arriving on the beaches uh, and the image behind you now paul is the same as the one bottom right yeah. there uh and that's where people think and in in sort of popular culture as well and saving private ryan band of brothers uh the images of the uh, uh the paratrooper at saint mary Glees, omaha beach uh our 
first uh, sixth airborne division over on the uh, on the eastern uh, bridgehead those are all the images people uh, people associate uh, so what you're seeing there is what people tend to think uh, with d-day and what i want to do is just wind it back effectively uh, and really look at how did those how did the bulk of those guys uh, get there and how did we sustain them uh, so if you move on to the next uh, slide on that it's really about the journey from uh, from Z to A, Z being point Z, the, the, the start off point for the invasion force effectively, uh, and point A being the assault areas uh, where we um, where they got into the boats and then proceeded to the to the beaches. So I, would talk, I want to talk about the hard yards that were done there, uh, or if you're going to say naval parlance, um, the hard fathoms. Uh, but it's, as you say, I, it, it's an area that just tends to be taken for granted, uh, but it shouldn't be. Uh, it was a huge effort, and it's a huge effort that continued beyond D-Day. So I think it's really useful, Paul, that your week is looking at the vital preparations for D-Day. And it's, it's why I was particularly pleased on, on things like uh, Peter, Cader, Paddy, Cad, Peter Caddick Adams' latest book. Uh, so much time is spent looking at the preparation for D-Day, uh, because these as you've drawn out throughout the week, were absolutely intrinsic to the success of uh, Operation Neptune, Operation Overlord. Uh, well, absolutely, so because ultimately it's it's a one-off. I mean, if, if it doesn't work for whatever reason, if an element of it falls short, the, the realistic chances of mounting a second operation, it's going to be months, if not years, and who knows what was going to happen that time. I know we now look back and say that, well, there's no way the Germans could have won the war. And yes, I'm not going to disagree with that, but there, nothing takes away the importance of getting that foothold into Europe, if for nothing else, to start freeing those countries. Because when people say, well, the Russians would have done it on their own, maybe they would, but how much more of Western Europe would have been Soviet-controlled post-war than, than, than free democracy? So when I'm asked, what well, was D-Day and Overlord necessary? I know we're going down a rabbit hole now. I say, yes, if you want to, con if the people in France and Belgium and Norway and Denmark want to continue with a similar style of lifestyle to what they got used to, which is a voting democracy under a, under a government they choose themselves. So, so and to start that off, you've got to get the nearly 7,000 ships to Normandy uh, this on, on, on June the 6th. So we'll go back up the image there. So your next one is, is the, is the, yeah, but Ramsey's quote there. Yeah, I um, so in terms of looking at the operation, um, the real this is the challenge that the uh, the naval forces faced in terms of the mine threat. You know, we had a known German mine barrier in the middle of the channel, uh, uh in the gray area there, so gray zone operations, if you like, with, with the difference. But beyond that, we really didn't know much at all about what the challenge was. Uh, we assumed there were mines there. Ramsey thought there might be a second uh, a line of mines uh, inside that area. And then in the Bay de Seine itself, there was a strong suspicion there'd be a lot of mines in there as well. But obviously, we just didn't have the recce that would tell us what was going on, uh, what was being put in the water there. So that was the situation we faced. And, and uh, Ramsey obviously had been conditioned by, uh, and he'd been uh, in Dover at the beginning of the war. Uh, and the early years where the, where the mine threat was it was a really, really significant threat around UK waters. So uh, as a British admiral, he was really conditioned and alert to the mine threat. So uh, hen hence his fears about the mine in the run up to D-Day and, and, and the reason that so much emphasis was uh, placed upon defeating it. Uh, admiral Kirk, who was the American admiral in charge of the Western Task Force, uh, although he said in his memoirs, uh, the famous quote about the, the keystone in the arch uh, being mind sweeping in terms of delivering victory. Um, I don't think the American, uh, the American senior naval officers were quite as, uh, as I would say, scared, but as, as, as respecting of the mine as perhaps their, their British counterparts. Um, I'm, uh, Kirk himself was definitely uh, worried about the, um, uh, the e-boat, the Schnell boot threat uh, was, was a real uh, concern for him and his, uh, his compatriots. And that was then exacerbated by, uh, the, by the disaster at uh, Exercise Tiger. Uh, but Kirk himself wasn't new to this. I mean, he, uh, he'd been involved in amphibious operations in the Mediterranean, so I, he brought a lot of experience as well. Uh, it's just at a time I think Ramsey was rather more concerned about the uh, the mine threat than uh, than Kirk was. Um, so that was the challenge we faced in in the uh, in in the Channel, and uh, the, those were those were the perceptions. And in terms of the the 
challenge that the UK had faced uh, in the early parts of the war, the mine was a significant threat uh, to our economic security and viability as the, uh, as the submarine had been. Um, and I'll talk about the, the magnetic mine threat early, uh, later. But uh, at some points, you know, shipping on the East Coast, uh, shipping in the Thames, was almost paralysed. Mm. And just, uh, we're getting questions in already, which is great, and whether you want to address this now or later, but Craig Farrett is asking about not just the the Axis mines, but of course the, the, the Allied mines. There would have been Allied mines in Channel, and what you know, worries about that? So I'm hoping you're going to cover that aspect as well. Yeah, and, and that that, uh, that will come up. So if I if I can uh, reserve reserve comment on that, and if Craig Perfect. can come back with a follow up, if I, if I don't address the the concerns he had. Super. Well, I'll, 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 let's let's continue then. This is great. Okay, so I want to move on now and talk about the mines uh, and the threat. Actually, and we talk about mines. The threat tends to be the minefield. Uh, so it's not just a single mine; it's a field of mines that, that present the threat, unless they take out one specific uh, mission essential uh, unit. So uh, one of the challenges, if we could just rewind one there, uh, uh, Rick, uh, was the, uh, one of the things working in our favor was that the, the German mine barrage in the mid channel, uh, well, we knew it was there, we knew it would be a problem, but the Germans probably hadn't had a chance to maintain it uh, in the way you need to maintain and sustain a minefield. So over a period of time, uh, mines tend to wander if they're the if they're the moored contact mines, or they tend to sort of self sterilize. Uh, so you need to keep reseeding these minefields. And one of the problems for the Germans was that we were we were definitely trying to stop them doing that in the in the mid channel barrier, and not just off Normandy. I mean that would have just been a giveaway. And we've spoke you've spoken uh, earlier in this uh, in this series about the need for OPSEC. So of course anywhere German sea ships were put into sea, we were going for them. Uh, and that was just, and that's just sea control versus sea denial. So it's classic. Uh, but the mines in the uh, in the uh, mid-channel barrier, uh, the ones we expected to be there because of the depth of water, were the contact mines, and those the uh, the two uppermost mines you can see there. I think when people think uh, of a of a naval mine, those are the sort of images they have. Um, these weren't new. I mean, we we'd uh, we'd been sweeping them in their thousands in the First World War, and, and they'd been used well before the First World War. Uh, they were of, normally of a contact variety, so you've got the contact horns on them. Um, and those, uh, you know, we pretty much knew how to deal with them. Uh, the problem was the developments they made in those sort of mines, uh, which uh, the whole story of mine warfare is is uh, measure and countermeasure and counter countermeasure. So that technological battle is a really fascinating aspect of the mine warfare story. So I mean, the Germans knew we could sweep these. Uh, so what do they do? Uh, you start laying them sh really shallow settings so you can take out the mine sweepers. Uh, you attach explosive devices to the mooring cables so it will blow them at the sweep wires. Uh, you set them to explode when they get cut and come to the surface. So again, you're going after the mine sweepers. Uh, you can attach float lines to the horns, so they'll snag in propellers of vessels and set them up. So all these sort of variations have to be taken into account. And then on top of that, you can lay them. Uh, they sit merrily on the seabed for days, weeks, and then come up as a delayed riser. So you think you've, you've cleared an area and uh, hey presto, the next morning there's a mine um, sat nicely at five fathoms waiting to waiting for any coming shipping. So that was that was the that was the moored contact mine, and that was what we expected to find in the in the, uh, in the channel barrier. Uh, Ramsey thought there might be a second one beyond that, uh, so that would have to be dealt with uh, as well. But then in the shallower waters, uh, the real problem child then uh, would be the uh, the influence mines, the mines laid on the seabed, uh, and these had been the real real threat to uh, uh, to our shipping since the war began. Um, Two types, magnetic and acoustic. Uh, the mine you can see bottom left uh, is quite a famous one. Uh, it's, um, it's one that was washed up on, well, laid, courtesy of the Luftwaffe, on uh, uh, Shubury Ness um, in the Thames Estuary uh, in November 1939. And um, these mines, at the time, we had no counter to them in, when they were introduced at the very beginning of the war. Uh, they were sinking huge numbers of vessels, and we didn't have a counter for them. 
we knew they they would exist. In fact, the the, the Britain had, had created and laid the first uh, magnetic mines, although they weren't very good ones at the uh, at the very end of the First World War. But without knowing those settings, you can't actually develop a sweep against them. So uh, we suspected the Germans would have these. The Germans did have them, laid them, and there was very, very little we could do about them at the time. So, so they, they really culled a lot of shipping um, in, the, uh, in the first year of the war. So those were magnetic mines uh, reacting against the magnetic signature of a ship. And then uh, a further variant that got laid in uh, 1940, Again, thank you, Luftwaffe. Uh, you laid some uh, where the experts from Vernon, uh, as they had done with the magnetic mine, the experts from Vernon could get in there and have a look at them. And these were the acoustic mines uh, set off uh, to be triggered by the acoustic signature uh, of a ship. Uh, and again, those, that, that required a whole new set of uh, uh, techniques for, uh, for mine sweeping those, which, uh, which I'll, I'll look at. And then you can just play tunes with these mines. You can play tunes with the settings uh, different sensitivities to take out different kinds of vessel, perhaps. Uh, arming delays so the mine doesn't become live for a certain amount of time. Uh, ship counts, so you know they'll let three ships go over before they go bang. And then you can start laying comb combination uh, mines. So they've got need an acoustic signature to prime it and then a magnetic sign signature uh, to set it off. You change the polarity of the settings on the magnetic mine. And it just makes the minesweeping task more and more difficult. Uh, and these, these ground influence mines are really, really potent. I mean, the, the contact mines, yeah, sure, they'll, they'll blow a hole in the side of your ship, uh, mission abort. Um, a ground influence mine if, could, could really easily break the back of a ship and just write it off completely. Wow. Well, I've learned I've learned a lot already. So this is this is fantastic. And please tell me when I need to move on with the slides because I'm I'm so I'm so captivated. I'll end up sitting on the same one. So well, well, we'll we'll, uh, we'll flick on to the next one if we uh, if we can, Paul. And we're just going to talk now about the the I just want to talk about the countermeasures that we uh, we introduced to uh, to counter these mines. And the first one was mechanical sweeping. Uh, and it's called an Oropisa sweep. Uh, those are Oropisa floats. You can be seen you see on the sweep decks of those vessels. Uh, and that evolution was known on minesweepers as a slinging tin, uh, you know, real proper seamanship, uh, getting this stuff in the water and creating a swept path where you're basically cutting uh, the mooring wires, mo mooring wires of these mines, bringing them to the surface where they can then be uh, uh, shot at, punctured, sink back down to the seabed and are safe. Uh, and you can adapt your formations to do this. What you're seeing there is a, a formation G. So each sweeper is tucked in behind the uh, the Oropisa sweep of the uh, one ahead. That's the safest form of mine sweeping, really. Uh, it's just the uh, it's just the junior ship up front that's going to take the uh, take the first hit. Uh, I'm saying this this was well known, and this the equipment, the techniques we're using were pretty much developed here in the uh, uh, in the First World War. Obviously, further refinements as the, as the Germans uh, refined their threat. Uh, but even in the last days of the war, we were losing ships to, uh, to contact mines doing this sort of business. So, so it, was never, it was never a safe evolution. And their bottom right, you look at uh, one of the, uh, they're called kites or otters, the, the gear that uh, gets the sweep down to a swept depth or gets the gear out to a swept width. Uh, that's what happens when, uh, when you encounter an explosive sweep uh, set to destroy the gear. So uh, a lot of attrition on sweep gear uh, could be expected in mine sweeping operations. But by and large, that's how we did the, uh, the mine sweeping. Uh, we've got the formation you sh I showed you there. Uh, other options were you could put a wire between uh, two vessels and, and just do what's called a team sweep. A uh, bit dangerous, both vessels are in unswept water. So this stage of the war, we really weren't doing that. Um, and if you want to be more aggressive, if you're in more of a rush, uh, you can put the sweepers outside uh, the, uh, the cut line of the vessel ahead and you're sweeping a broader path. You're going to have a, a, a quicker sweep through an area. But of course, your risk levels are going up. So uh, that would only be done in a, in a real emergency. So that was, that was the mechanical sweeping. Uh, if we then look at, go back to the influence mines and look at the ways we've got to influence sweeping. So next slide. Yeah, and so building on uh, Lieutenant Commander Ouvry uh, won the first naval awards uh, in World War II for uh, 
for rendering safe that uh, magnetic mine on the on the sands at Shubury Ness. Uh, and after that, we had to develop, uh, try and find a way to counter the magnetic mine. Uh, what you're seeing here is what was called the double L. Uh, two buoyant legs that were streamed astern of a minesweeper, uh, operating in formation, pulsing, and uh, hopefully setting off, uh, creating a large magnetic signature, which would hopefully uh, set off the magnetic mine at a safe distance uh, from uh, from your vessel. Uh, top right, you get what you call a snake's wedding. That's when you haven't got enough deck space to handle the double L properly. Uh, but before the double L came along, uh, we were looking at lots of options for mine sweeping uh, in the emergency of 1939-40. Uh, we developed a mine sweeping uh, system that would fit on Wellington bombers um, called the DWI. That was um, like a circular loop you, you can see on photographs of Wellington bombers. Uh, that was effective, but it was a very narrow swept path. Um, we also fitted out old colliers with big electromagnetic coils, which would create a whacking great magnetic signature. Those were called mine destructor vessels. Uh, those would get shaken to bits in a, in a pretty short order, but would, would uh, certainly clear up the mines for a while. And one of the earlier ones also was uh, called the Bosun's Nightmare. Uh, you streamed at the stern of a vessel it was a collection of about 48 magnetic uh, pieces of metal of different lengths. Uh, and it was no fun to stream, no fun to deploy, uh, with the added bonus that it wasn't very effective either. So uh, by this stage in the war, 1944, pretty much any sweeper that could take this gear would have the double L on the back. And it was proving a very, very effective uh, magnetic sweep. Uh, interestingly, right at the end of the war, the Germans had refined their settings uh, of their mines such that this was about to become obsolescent. But uh, fortunately for um, 44, early, early part, part of 45, this was still the bee's knees as far as uh, magnetic sweeping was concerned. Uh, and maybe this is a dumb question, and if, if it is, I apologise. But you know, when we talk about things like armoured warfare, everyone has an idea about which nation made the best stuff. Is, is there a kind of... A, an idea that one of the nations has the best mine clearing technology? Is it the British? Is it the Germans? Is it the Americans? Is there a, you know, with among people like yourselves, is there a generally accepted um, answer to that question? Uh, I, well, I, I think uh, I think it's probably undeniable that the, I'm, I would say, I, I'm biased. You know, I did 40 yeah, years. Yeah, I, I realise, you know, 40 years in the career, you know, you're not going to... Uh, but, you know, the yeah. Royal Navy's level of experience in the First and Second World Wars, uh, I think it put it put it there on, on sort of the uh, prima inter palace, if you like. You know, I, I, it was the Royal Navy. It was, it was, and it's not just the kit. And, the, and it's the mindset. It's the ethos. It's the awareness of the issue. And, you know, and if we if we fast forward to today, I, I think that's still why the Royal Navy, uh, despite, you know, whatever limitations we have in terms of the num number of sweep, uh, number of minesweeper hunters we've got or whatever, uh, it's just that mindset, that hard-won experience, which the Royal Navy has then consistently delivered on in the years since the Second World War. We're looking at Korea, the Falklands, Gulf War One, Gulf War Two, the Red Sea, Suez. So I, I would still put the Royal Navy as, as, as the leading uh, MCM force in the world. Uh, if I... uh, so anyway, that's that, that's uh, that, that's just but that's a very very personal view. So you know, anyone can come back to me on that one. Uh, and now we move on uh, to the uh, acoustic sweeps. Um, so, as I said, the, the, Vernon, uh, the Vernon team had already been doing uh, measuring ship's acoustic signatures. They thought the acoustic mine would be on its way. Uh, and so they were proved right in the summer of 1940. Uh, they'd already been doing work. They knew what a lot of their vessels' acoustic signatures were, which was going to be very, very useful in developing a significant counter. Uh, immediately, the recourse was... Uh, pretty agricultural and dropping explosive charges uh, in the water, uh, the guy top left, uh, firing machine gun bursts in the water, uh, dropping grenades in the water, all set to tr hoping to trigger uh, acoustic mines with fairly coarse signatures. And actually, I, I these were surprisingly effective. And one, one of the only reasons we had to stop doing the machine guns and the uh, grenades was because after Dunkirk, we, we, we didn't have a great many of them. Um, but the serious stuff started with uh, decided to use a, uh, a road drill uh, called a Kango hammer, a pneumatic road drill. And they put that in the forepeak of a vessel, um, flooded the forepeak, so right down in the bows below the waterline, 
uh, turned on the uh, turned on the hammer, and uh, hey, you've got an acoustic minesweeper, and this proved uh, this proved really effective. Uh, the next refinement on that is to put it in a drum and uh, or something equivalent to the hammer, and dangle it over the bows of your minesweeper, and that's what you can see bottom left on the uh, on the bows of an uh, a motor minesweeper so it's in the stowed position there but you can see the a-frame that's going to deploy yeah, yeah. and then moving on from that uh they give it ways of streaming it a beam uh, from a, a small davit uh, by the bridge wing and that uh, that allowed you to go uh, at a higher speed and that was how, uh, what a lot of the fleet sweepers would use in that configuration so there's uh, there's your acoustic sweeper uh, so, uh, so that was that. And the problem was, the challenge was, of course, you get Germans using a combination of magnetic and acoustic. Then you're going to go along, you're going to have uh, your acoustic uh, sweep deployed and your magnetic sweep deployed. Uh, and you know, fingers crossed on the settings on that. But those were the sort of sweeping techniques that we were talking about uh, at, this, uh, at this point in the war. Uh, so I let, let's... If you're happy, Paul, unless you have a question, I'm quite happy to move on now to the, the sweepers themselves. Yeah, please, please do. And then, we'll, and then I think what we'll do is, because people are saving up questions, we'll perhaps leave the questions till later on, because I think, I think folks, I wouldn't be surprised if Nick doesn't cover all the things you're asking. And if he hasn't, then we can come at them in, because I don't kind of interrupt the flow at the moment, but it's, it's fascinating stuff, and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Oh, I'm pleased to hear that. Okay, right. So let's talk about the Orbat, this minesweepers uh, for, uh, for D-Day and... and Neptune Overlord. Uh, interesting debate at the moment as to whether it's Neptune or Overlord or whether Overlord really existed as an operation. Um, lots of figures for how many minesweepers uh, were used uh, for uh, Neptune, I stick with Neptune. Uh, and the figures are all over the place. I mean, I'm just looking here, Roskill has got 287, uh, Admiral Ramsey has only got 255. Uh, I've seen figures 350 quoted elsewhere. Uh, there's a very good book by Peter Elliott called Allied Minesweeper in World War II. Uh, he's done quite a thorough analysis. He comes out with 305, uh, of which 270 odd were British uh, Royal Navy. So, uh, and that's the figure. So I think we're talking about all sorts, all types, all vessels contributing to uh, uh, minesweeping, ignoring the adage that every vessel can be a minesweeper once. We're talking about 305 minesweepers, um, divided into two broad categories. Uh, first of all, we have the fleet sweepers, which is what I'm showing you here. Uh, fleet sweepers were sort of main deployed survivable operations. So they were useful for expeditionary operations. They could sort of take care of themselves. Uh, they could keep up with the main fleet, which is where the name uh, fleet minesweeper came from. And they got better endurance and uh, you know, better legs uh, could stay on task longer and were generally looked upon to be to be uh, the more effective uh, lots of caveats on that statement though. <laughs> uh, now a big challenge was posed from my sweeping forces when uh, montgomery and eisenhower decided that uh, a three division landing front was was not going to be enough that they needed five beaches of course uh, if you're planning on uh, if you're planning on sweeping uh, your assault forces um, into just three beaches, expanding that to five, that, that's quite a big ask. So, uh, so you're really sort of then scratching around for your minesweeping forces. Because at this stage, the Royal Navy and the US Navy are not just sweeping in, um, in Northwest Europe, they're in the Mediterranean. You know, the Americans are in the Pacific. Uh, we're in the Pacific. Uh, we're off, uh, off the Red Sea. We're off East Africa. So, you know, you're talking about a finite number of uh, sweepers. So they get, they're getting the sweepers together from wherever they can. Uh, top left, uh, uh, lovely old ships. These, these are called Smoky Joes. Uh, they were designed during the First World War. They didn't quite enter service uh, in the First World War, uh, but they were uh, fleet sweepers. Uh, they had been laid up during the 1930s. They were in reserve. And we had one flotilla of these uh, were used uh, for D-Day in the assault sweeping role. Um, and these these guys had been sweeping constantly since uh, September 1939, or as soon as they'd been activated out of reserve. They'd been in places like Singapore, Malta, uh, Hong Kong, laid up in reserve. 
but you know, they did a good job. Uh, from 1945 onwards, they were going to be retired from service there. Uh, the interesting thing for me about the, this uh, flotilla was uh, operational security, OPSEC. As I say, they were coal burners. Uh, as a saying about them that there were uh, uh, columns of smoke by day and pillars of fire by night. Uh, <laughs> so uh, bringing them into the beaches was, would, have been, would have posed some interesting questions for operational security, in my view. They, they'd have been quite, quite visible. Uh, but anyway, we had one flotilla of these. And then the uh, top center, top right images, uh, these are Banger class. Uh, these were fairly, originally thought of as coastal sweepers. They were, were brought into the fleet role because, because we needed them so badly. Um, these were a pre-war design, and we had five flotillas of these. A flotilla is around, around 10 vessels. Um, four of them were Royal Navy flotillas, hugely experienced. Uh, the, these guys had been sweeping... Uh, uh, some of them, uh, uh, Diego Suarez, some of them in the Mediterranean, uh, some of them around UK waters. But the, these these vessels had been sweeping nonstop since they were introduced into service uh, from uh, around 1941 onwards. Uh, top right is uh, a Canadian uh, Banga class. And um, the Canadians provided a minesweeping flotilla here uh, for the operation as well, the 31st minesweeping flotilla. Uh, challenge for the 31st was that it didn't arrive in uh, in UK waters until April uh, because these vessels, uh, all of these vessels on screen were capable of providing escort services, escort duties as well. Uh, these had been doing escorting uh, anti-submarine work off the uh, eastern seaboard of Canada. So they really weren't that worked up in uh, in minesweeping. So that they had to be, uh, they had to be worked up, the crews, the kits, the, the techniques. Uh, they, they really received a crash course, uh, but and they, they performed really, really credibly um, on, on D-Day and, and in, the, in the weeks that followed. Uh, bottom left, we had one flotilla of uh, Halcyon class. Uh, these were uh, a pre-war design. They'd been built just before the outbreak of the Second World War. Uh, very effective minesweepers. Uh, this flotilla had been, uh, had been minesweeping uh, just prior to the outbreak of war in 1939, spent uh, the first year or two of the war up with uh, the home fleet at Scapa Flow, sweeping around uh, Scapa and off, uh, off Scotland. Then they'd spent about uh, two years deployed in Russian waters. So these vessels had been um, providing local escort duties uh, between Iceland and, uh, and Russia on the Mars convoys. And they'd also been uh, mine sweeping uh, around the Kola Inlet off, off the Mars. So uh, these vessels had seen some serious service. Uh, the Halcyons lost four vessels uh, during this Russian commitment through various causes. Uh, so uh, these were brought down fairly late, fairly late in the day from Russia, uh, beginning of 44. Uh, some of them were still up in Russian waters. So these guys didn't have a lot of time to get ready. And then bottom right, the most modern, the most capable of the vessels in your bat were the Algerine class uh, uh, fleet sweepers. Uh, three flotillas of these. Uh, one of them was brand new, fresh out of the box. It only just formed up and had been working uh, working up. Uh, another flotilla had just come back from uh, Iceland, Loch U, where it had been providing local escort and local sweeping services. And uh, another flotilla had been doing a lot of sweeping around the UK waters. So those were the fleet sweepers. Uh, and 10 flotillas of those were going to, uh, were going to sweep their way in and... Uh, be the sort of tip of the sword into the beaches. So I'm going to ask a question, and if you're covering this later, then just tell me to shut up. But the flotillas, does each flotilla have a specific task, or do they all have multitasks? And within that, does each ship within the flotilla, is it is it set up for acoustic mines or magnetic mines, or how, how do they how do they break down the who does what aspect? Well, the, these, these fleet sweepers in the initial assaults, uh, and I will come to it, but I'll answer the question now, they're going to be wire sweeping through that initial barrier. Right. And then they're going to be fingers crossed going into like the red zone where we, they don't know what happens because uh, these are not capable of, uh, of wire sweeping, influence sweeping at the same time, effectively. They, they can perhaps put out their acoustic sweeps, uh, but, but not, the, uh, not a magnetic sweep as well. So the first priority is get the vessels through that mine barrier and any second right. mine that might be there. 
So, uh, so that's what they're going to do. And they each, uh, so they're each dedicated to that role. Um, how, how they organize for that sweep uh, will we'll come to. And then after, after that, then there will be tasks specific to, to what comes next in terms of the mine sweeping operations. So that's how you'll do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm just realizing just how, how complicated this. And then, and then there's other thing which has come up in the sidebar, which I'm sure we'll address as well, is the, uh, is, well, you talked about it yourself, the security of the whole operation is that if the Germans get wind of what's going on, if, if all this takes too long, if, I mean, there's a deadline. The deadline is H hour is set and everything begins at H hour. And if for any reason you miss H hour, everything else falls apart because we're already at the point where the airborne operations have started. So there are troops landing by parachute and by glider who are expecting link ups with beach troops. If the beach troops don't get there because the mines aren't swept, it's the that there's a lot hinging on this and um yeah it's it, my respect is going up massively every by every second but I, I will hand over to you again to keep on listening because i'm learning a huge amount today yeah well let's just stay with this and the mindset of, of these guys is absolutely focused on we will we will get the landing forces to the beaches uh absolutely no question in their minds that they will do whatever it takes and that's from the top to the bottom I and mean, ramsey tells them you know whatever happens if you come under attack while you're mine sweeping, you continue mine sweeping. All that matters is that you sweep that water. And then the, 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 the senior officers for each flotilla is pretty much issuing the same direction. You know, you know if you sink, if you're going to sink, don't swing, sink in the swept channel, sink outside the swept channel. And the commanding officer of one of these mine sweepers, uh, one of the Algerines, I think, uh, his navigator asked him, so, you know, so why, why, you, why have you brought white gloves on board? And the answer was, well, if we sink, when we sink outside the swept channel, I'm going to stand on the uh, on the mast of my vessel protruding above water, directing with my white gloves the ships to show them which way they've got to go. And where wow. Wow, well, that's dedication. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, there, were, there, were, there were supporting forces. There were destroyer forces, cruiser forces who were expected to step in. But basically, you know, if, if these guys were going to be set upon by uh, e-boats or whatever, They've returned fire, but they weren't going to be maneuvering. They were going to just continue sweeping uh, for as long as it took. So, so that was that was that was sort of the mindset. Then. Wow. Well, I'll move on to our next photo. Yeah, and, and these uh, uh, these I would call like the auxiliary uh, sweepers. So these were going to be working in uh, in the shallower waters, uh, where the influence mines were expected to abound. Uh, top left, you have what's called uh, motor mine sweepers. Uh, I think we had seven flotillas of motor mine sweepers uh, dedicated to the operation on, on D-Day. Um, built out of wood, uh, cheap and cheerful. Obviously, wood's a good thing if you're, if you're thinking about magnetic mines. Um, fitted with the uh, acoustic sweep, fitted with a magnetic sweep. They could do both together. Uh, a real plethora of these vessels and really... These are these have been taking over increasingly from the trawlers in 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 doing the influence sweeping around UK waters, and these these were good to go to work the inshore routes uh, and do that there. What they didn't have was, if you like, the grunt uh, to uh, to deploy a uh, a wire sweep. Uh, pulling a wire sweep behind you requires a, a lot of uh, a lot of horsepower. Uh, these guys just didn't have it. But for influence sweeping, they were they were completely on top of it. These 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 were good boats, and they were going to do an excellent job inshore. Uh, as were um, the vessels top right, uh, two kinds really. There were uh, British and American. They're all built in America. These vessels and these were coming on tap from late 1942 onwards, called yard minesweepers or British yard minesweepers, uh, YMS or BYMS. Uh, and these were small, really, really handy uh, minesweepers and could do a bit of everything. And these were going to work in shore as well, uh, shallow draft. And we had, um, I think we had seven flotillas of, uh, of uh, two American and five British flotillas of the, uh, of the yard minesweepers. Uh, and then looking towards the bottom, uh, it's a bit, uh, I wouldn't really call these uh, auxiliaries actually. These, these were gusting fleet sweepers. Uh, this, the Royal Navy called these the Catherine class. Again, they were American built. Uh, the Americans called them the uh, AMS, the American minesweepers. We called them the uh, British American minesweepers. And we called out 
Catherine class as well. So there was a flitter of each of these, uh, and these were going to be um, charged with uh, their first job was going to be following in and starting to clear the uh, clear the areas for the bombarding ships. So uh, two flitters of these were going to have a, a significant role on uh, on D-Day itself. So as I say, 305 ships, and then we look at the other ones we're not mentioning, the down layers. It's no good. It's no good sweeping a channel for vessels if you're not marking it so they can follow it. So with each um, each flotilla, you've got three or four down layers laying down buoys to mark the swept channel. Um, preceding them, you've got uh, motor launches who are sweeping ahead of your fleet sweepers, a skim sweep to try and take out any of the shallow set mines uh, designed to take out mine sweepers. Uh, and also you've got landing craft themselves are fitted with, uh, with sweeps to work the inshore area as well. So we're throwing a, a lot of stuff at the mine threat because a lot of it is unknown, but we're working on worst case scenario. So, uh, so those are the auxiliary sweepers we have. And then if we, we move on now, Paul, and look at the very shallow water aspect, uh, we're talking about swimmers and divers. And on, on the British beaches, beaches, you had what were called the lock use the landing craft uh, obstruction clearance units. Um, you see them top left there. And they were going to la land just after the assault waves and they were going to be starting to blow the, uh, the obstructions uh, clear past the landing craft. Uh, and the Americans had the same on their beaches, although they were these were Royal Navy, Royal Marine uh, swimmer divers off the British beaches. Uh, the Americans had uh, naval combat demolition units, I think they're called MCDUs, off the American yeah. beach. Which uh, evolved to the UDTs. I, I know one of those guys. Uh, I've met a couple of those in Normandy, and they're, they're ama amazing guys because they multiple skill sets. You know, they, they, they as you said, diving, demolitions. They were also trained infantrymen in case they ended up on the beach. But it, 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 they're, they're, I think of the, of the groups of veterans I've met, the ones that had the most things they had been trained in. Uh, and, and, and they were brilliant, all of them. Incredible guys. And uh, we lost a few on the British beaches, but the the, uh, the NCDUs on Omaha Beach took a really heavy hit, as you yeah. expect, given what happened on, on that beach on, on that day. And then, uh, not so relevant for D-Day, but th these chaps were working in Wistram on D plus one, bottom right, are the pea parties. So these are Royal Navy divers who were doing port clearance. So they're going into captured ports, uh, and they're just checking for booby traps, mines, any other obstructions in, in captured ports. As I say, these were working uh, Wistram D plus one, uh, and these provided a, a key uh, a key capability in, uh, in all the ports we captured and needed to reopen. So those were the, uh, those were the sort of um, capabilities we had. Um, I'll look now, uh, look at where did we get our experience from? Where did, where did we learn our lessons? Uh, and I'll, I'll try and counter through this one, Paul. Uh, so we'd, we'd been in the assault sweeping business for quite a while, and we started in November 42, top left, Diego Suarez, uh, sweeping in uh, Operation Ironclad, risky business, and appalling, appallingly uh, marked channel, so we lost a lot of mine sweeping gear there. Uh, four Corvettes uh, sweeping for... Uh, uh, four of the bangers sweeping in there, and uh, I think we lost one Corvette due to a mine there. So that was what the first of the assault sweeping uh, uh, operations we did. And moved to uh, Operation Jubilee, uh, two, uh, two flotillas of banger sweepers sweeping in. A night operation, just as uh, uh, Diego Suarez had been a night operation. So we're already building up a lot of competence, a lot of experience in, in in doing this stuff at night, which was obviously going to be hugely important. Uh, no, mi no mines found on, on, on this operation. And then just ramping up in terms of scale, the center picture, uh, we're looking at Operation Torch, uh, American and British minesweepers involved there. Uh, no mines, uh, the Western Task Force are out of shot on this, so my apologies. Uh, but they were coping with very, very significant surf and sea states. So. Uh, uh, some uh, some hard lessons there in terms of uh, in terms of uh, sweeping in marginal conditions, and the Eastern Task Force. Uh, the weather a bit more benign, uh, but dealing with uh, sweeping there, uh, sweeping the invasion force in there, and then really ramping up again. You get Operation Husky, Sicily, top right, 
July 43, uh, combination of American and, uh, and uh, Royal Navy vessels there. And we're talking here now about fleet minesweepers. We're talking about uh, motor minesweepers. We're talking about um, the, the yard minesweepers, British or otherwise. And we're talking about uh, uh, motor launches and sweeping here as well. It's probably the first time. Uh, and this was a technique they developed actually at Malta because uh, uh, Malta was so strapped earlier in the war for minesweeping assets and it was being so heavily mined that uh, some innovative thinking with the, in the motor launch community started to use the motor launches there. So that was uh, Operation Husky. Then we go to Avalanche, uh, Operation Avalanche, to, um, Salerno, uh, quite large minefields there. Again, American and British forces interchanging, uh, covering each other's forces. So you're getting a lot of integration there. Uh, significant mines are swept. And then uh, in sort of final, if you like, rehearsal for D-Day uh, was um, Operation Shingle, the, uh, the invasion, uh, or sorry, the, the amphibious assault on the hook at uh, Anzio. Um, and a common thread on these in terms of lessons where you need to, uh, you need to make sure your time space management, your water, manage, water space management is, is hugely important. Uh, separating the sweepers from the assault forces uh, making sure the sweepers have got time to do their job. Where do the sweepers cut off so they're not interfering with the final uh, assault element of the landing craft going in? Uh, please try and make landing craft, uh, landing ships stick to the swept channels, make them understand even what swept channels are. Uh, all this sort of stuff are all the lessons we're learning there. Don't overload your sweepers. Make sure you've got lots of sweepers to do the job. Make sure you've got lots of spare gear because a lot of it is going to get written off. So these are the sort of lessons we're learning uh, and are being sort of sent back either with ships, either with personnel uh, or, or just um, after action reports. That's all getting fed in to the, uh, to the people who are now preparing for the, uh, the D-Day invasion itself. So right. that's, that's where we get our experience from. And is, uh, it, is it fair to say that Overlord was going to be the, the, the most challenging of these operations? It, you yeah. know, simply because they, you know, the the Germans know we're going to be coming at some point. The this, the, the the geography of the Channel and Britain being there and France being there and and the volume, just the sheer enormity of the operation it, it, and the time scale. It, it just, I mean, I'm glad I, I hadn't really thought about the fact there'd been these 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 practice operations. But of course, it absolutely makes sense. We're we're practicing everything. It just my my brain is on overload there, but think, taking in a lot of information I just hadn't thought about before. So I can only thank you again for no and. The, the lessons I, uh, and what we now call in the Navy lessons learned or lessons identified process is something I, I really need to do some more digging on. But I think and Jack Hunter who is a student at the University of Portsmouth is doing a, a PhD on, on, I think, is going to touch on this aspect. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing the results of that. I'm, I'm looking forward to having a beer with Jack. He, judging by his comments and the sidebar, he clearly knows what he's talking about. I don't feel qualified uh, to challenge any of his statements. I'm letting him. I'm letting him handle the sidebar. He's doing an admirable job on there. Right. It's, uh, I hope, it's I hope he's, I hope he's agreeing with me some of the time. At least. Most, I think, it seems to be. Yeah, I think he's just add, adding some, um, adding some, um, some, some information really. But yeah, amazing stuff. Okay, so, um, so that's 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 what's happening. So now let, let's let's look at the plan it, it, itself. Um, so we're going from Z to A. So uh, the idea is uh, for each beach, each of the five beaches, we're going to sweep two channels with fleet sweepers down through what we call uh, the spout uh, and going through that minefield that we know about and dealing with whatever comes comes through. So, uh, so uh, that is the plan. Uh, the... Uh, and that's 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 the that's what we see when we think of the uh, the Normandy Beach. Yeah. Those, those ten channels being cut through, and then beyond them, the transport areas, the launching areas, deploying areas, the fire the fire bombard, bomb, bombardment areas. So the phases are Ramsey sets out four phases for the operation. First of all, get through that channel, get through that channel, sweep them into the assault area. Phase two. In a process where you're you're shifting now from the fleet sweepers to the auxiliaries, uh, plus the uh, 
the American uh, AMS and the British uh, BAMS Catherine class. You're now bringing those forward and you're going to start working the bombardment areas and the transport areas working closer and closer up to the coast. Then you're going to go back with your fleet sweepers and you're going to start widening those channels so you've got much more space to play with. All the time you're going to be marking these areas. So you've got a lot of dam boys going in the water here, a lot of flashing lights, a lot of, a lot of marker boys. Um, and then it's just the general housekeeping. Whatever, phase four is whatever follows, uh, whatever follows, what comes next. Uh, so don't deal with it. Uh, phase four is basically deal with whatever comes up. So those are the four phases of the, uh, of the operation. Um, as I mentioned, the, the marking of the channels is going to be hugely important. Uh, the formation that the, uh, the sweepers are going to adopt for this, based on all the lessons uh, we've learned, going into, the, uh, into that minefield and doing the main, uh, the main spade work of getting down towards the assault area on the minesweepers. If you can just flo uh, flash up that, uh, that one I sent you uh, a couple of hours ago, uh, Paul. So that's, that's the typical formation for your, um, uh, for your assault minesweeping package. Uh, you've got two, um, two motor launchers in front with their light minesweeping gear deployed, uh, one tucked behind the other. You've then got your, your flotilla of, of nine or ten. You're going to have six of them out there sweeping. And then you're going to have two or three tucked in with sweeps at short stay, ready to move out to cover the gaps caused by the loss of any other vessel. So they're already, we're talking about battle casualties there, ready to replace anything that goes off. And then you've got Dan boys uh, ready to Dan both sides of the channel as it goes down. So if I'm if I'm understanding that diagram correctly, t ten ten vessels in the flotilla, six sweeping, kind of effectively four in reserve. They they've kind of built into this a kind of a thirty percent um, loss rate almost. Yeah, and um, uh, you know I, I'm even looking at the detail in some of the orders. One of the, one of the flotillas, uh, the the senior officer of the flotilla designates the chain of command if he's sunk down to the fourth or fifth ship uh, on. So he's in worst case scenario planning. He knows that if we lose the first four ships, number number five knows who's in charge. So uh, I think that's kind of that's kind of a blowing my mind moment of really of just how how much attention attention to deal. I, mean, I know we know there is some general negativity in advance of Operation Overlord stroke Neptune. I did see Stephen Fisher's thread on Twitter about you know the the, the name. In, uh, change that or the name discussion but you know I mean, we know that lee mallory was predicting 70 percent of airborne forces being killed before the hitting the ground so we, we you know it's always wise to go in these things with a level of caution you don't want to go into them all cavalier like assuming everything's going to be going fine but it does it's really it's really hammering home to me how important this operation was and the and the risk involved because as you say once they get beyond that known that known minefield it's you know you don't know what you're going to find someone asked earlier about did we get any information from kriegsmarine pow's and i didn't the reason i didn't mention at the time is even if a kriegsmarine guy tells you something you can't trust that you you have to you know, would you ever trust anybody who says yes that area of those over there is definitely clear you, you, you you're gonna no matter what information you've got you're gonna have to practically sweep you cannot take anything on a on a piece of information that may or may not be completely useless yeah, you, 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 and as you say, you just can't afford to take that risk. It's well, just got to be swept. And this is the minesweeping formation. Uh, uh, but what's interesting about it is that uh, when uh, when Rommel's uh, beach defences started to crop up, as, as you know, Paul, they, they changed H hour. And yeah. changing H hour uh, so that you're, you're landing just on the turn of the tide, just as it's starting to flood, created huge problems for the minesweepers. Because originally uh, they were... Um, they were going to go in uh, with just the tide heading in one direction. Uh, and you, when you're deploying a sweep like this, you, it's called sweeping to advantage. You always put out your down, down tide sweep because you get a much wider sweep back. The changing of H hour meant that these guys had to start sweeping halfway across in this formation. And then because the tide turned significantly, wow. they would then have to change their sweep, their, instead of sweeping to starboard, sweep to port. 
Plus, they had yeah. to uh, they had to sort of uh, not get ahead too far ahead of the uh, uh, the assault forces themselves. So they had to turn back at some point halfway across and kill an hour and a half. So what they did is they reversed course for an hour, effectively. They, they all fell into one line behind the senior officer, about turn, head north again, haul in, haul in one set of sweeps, put out the other set of sweeps, then turn back into formation and start streaming, streaming to port. So this was a real complex operation. They had very, very little time to practice this, even though I, I think this measure might have been introduced even after exercise uh, Fabius. So. I don't. I don't think they had a lot of time to practice this, and the fact that they did it, and and you know, yeah, even like the least worked up uh, flotilla, the Canadian Thirty First, did it, got it right, is uh, is a huge testament to um, to how well they did. But anyway, wow. that, that was so. That was that was anyway the plan for the sweeping. And um, I just talked briefly about the precursor operations as well. And this will talk about the uh, the mine laying uh, question and, and the British mines. Uh, yeah, and, and we laid a, a lot of mines, obviously, off the French coast, primarily targeted against the uh, against the ports. Uh, obviously, Lorient, Saint Nazaire, uh, Brest had come in for a huge amount of attention, and those mines that we laid there would obviously be relevant for D-Day. But we also uh, initiated in uh, March, April, uh, Operation Maple, and this was an operation that put down seven thousand mines, purely. Uh, geared towards defending uh, the uh, the Normandy um, invasion area, uh, and we used uh, I think there were ten flotillas of um, coastal forces uh, units, uh, RF um, Halifaxes, Lancasters, Stirlings, Hamden uh, Stirlings were uh, were all part of this, and they were laying a series of uh, minefields off likely spots along the French and Belgian coasts. And obviously, we couldn't concentrate this uh, just off Normandy this, or just around the Normandy beachhead because, again, op operational security, it becomes a bit of a giveaway. But, uh, but we laid a lot of uh, mines just to, just to seal this, off, this area off. We didn't lay any mines, obviously, off Caen or um, uh, I don't think we laid that many off uh, close into Cherbourg because that was the, the first port we were looking to capture. And use. Indeed. Yeah. So those are precursor operations there. Uh, and then an another element of it was, um, uh, I just want to talk about navigational accuracy. Uh, it's no good being good at mine sweeping if, if you don't, you know, if you don't have repeatability, if, if people don't know where the swept channel is. So um, we had an interesting operation with the uh, Harbour Defence motor launches. And uh, I think about 31st of uh, May, they had to go out and they laid some underwater so uh, sonar buoys. Uh, which were due to become active uh, on the 4th of June. Uh, and those uh, became markers for the beginning of the, the swept channels. And then what happened is uh, just prior to D-Day, uh, the, uh, the motor launches, another set of motor launches went out, located those. Uh, and these, these uh, HDMLs, they were fitted with the latest navigation equipment, uh, fitted with uh, what Bomber Command called g navigation uh, qh navigation system for navigation accuracy they were fitted with that they were fitted with the very very latest uh, a new system the deco navigation system uh, qm uh, so they could go out locate these boys point them and basically the the minesweepers would head towards those and use those as a start point for the swept channels to initiate the sweep so that accuracy was uh, was really important and then if we look at the uh, quite a nice touch here and uh, the breaking news almost if we go to that uh, that photo of the uh, with the aircraft in uh, Paul, next one. uh bottom left I'm sorry uh, just a few yep. weeks ago i think uh, it's been in the news um uh family bought a, an old rotting boat cause they fancied a boat in the wrexham area and uh, that boat is uh and this has been in the news in the last week uh, Harbour Defence Motor Launch uh, 1392, I think her number is, and uh, she laid, or she she marked the channel for Channel 6 leading into uh, Gold Beach for uh, on D-Day. So she, she was there on, uh, on the 5th and 6th of June. So I just thought that was a nice touch. It is, yeah. And now we come to uh, Der Tag, uh, the day itself. Uh, so, I'm, 
It doesn't get off to a great start because everything gets delayed by bad weather. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to... Uh, can you hear that noise in the background? Yeah, I can a bit. Yeah, it doesn't... Can you just excuse me? I'm just going yeah. to go I'll, I'll talk for a second. Don't Please worry. Do. Um, this, this is amazing stuff, isn't it? I'm, I'm really enjoying I'm learning so much. So I, I, I know you've some of you have got some questions we'll bring in a bit later towards the end, but this, I think... Nick has got this thoroughly planned, um, rather like a mind sweeping operation. I think at the beginning, the middle and end has all been planned by Nick. So we will have some time for questions at the end, but this, I'm, my mind is being blown by just how amazing this operation is. Right. I'm back. Good. So yeah, I'm obviously the delay is going to, is going to cause problems. And the, f the first problem is that the, uh, the two mice who can fertilize coming out of Falmouth to uh, to uh, sweep in uh, Force U to Utah Beach, uh, they have to set off early, uh, and they have to sweep all the way to uh, Point Z because or Piccadilly Circus because that route hasn't been swept. Uh, all the other ones have been maintained. Uh, they've even been dealing with some uh, short notice calls. Uh, a field was laid at short notice off New Haven where part of Force Sword was. Uh, but um, the sweepers leave early from uh, uh, from Falmouth and uh, don't get the order to the pound term when it's cancelled. And just as uh, I think the destroyers and patrol boats are catching up with them, say, hey, guys, turn around. One of the Fanga flotillas locates the minefield. Uh, so start sweeping that minefield before they head back into Falmouth. Uh, thereafter, all the other routes uh, up to Point Z are, are known to be clear. Um, and those are part of the precursor operations, just making that making sure that's clear. They haven't been able to do any more because, again, operational security. If you start sweeping lots down towards the bay the same, uh, yeah. down about before before D Day or before D minus one, it's just an you know, it's an absolute giveaway as, as to where, where your area of interest is. So, and the forces come together, and actually, it all goes pretty well. I'm they, uh, they, the false alarms start, they start again, uh, they, the uh, force uniform minesweepers finish off that minefield en route to uh, Force Z, and it's here that we suffer our first casualty, uh, a naval casualty. The uh, USS Osprey, one of the American minesweepers, uh, uh, triggers a mine, and so she's, uh, she's lost. Uh, so she's, uh, she, she's a casualty. Uh, but the, the vessels sweep down from, uh, from Piccadilly Circus. Uh, again, the, uh, the uh, Utah beach sweepers, they can see, they can see France. They can see the, uh, the Cotentin uh, Peninsula from about uh, 7.55 in the evening on 5th of June. They're inside of it. And within a couple of hours, they say they're able to make out um, individual houses on on the shore um so wow. they're getting they're getting pretty in adjacent and it, it's sort of it's still something of a mystery as, as to why they they weren't spot why they weren't spotted or why it didn't ring an alarm certainly from 21 30 onwards sweepers start to uh, i know you're talking about ra radar uh, the counter radar operations tomorrow, tomorrow night. yeah at 9 30 all the sweepers are fitted with uh, the sweepers are all Lead sweepers are all fitted with uh, radio countermeasures. They switch those on at 21:30 just to hide their hide their positions from enemy radar. So they're already sort of just trying to uh, cover that. Uh, but they, they must have been visible at some point. And I think part of the wider issue is just the weather was so bad. People weren't maintaining a good lookout. Uh, but they were. They could have been seen. They could have been seen. But they they, they come down. Uh, they sweep through the mine barrier. Uh, I think they they get thirty to thirty five mines down going through that mine barrier on the way down, which isn't as many as they expected. Uh, the the motor launches in front of uh, one of the flotillas, uh, bag a couple, which would have taken out a couple of the mine sweepers. So uh, so that's that's good news. Uh, and by about three thirty in the morning, uh, we're then in a position to start sweeping down towards the assault area itself. And the, then the auxiliaries, the MMS, the, the BYMS, uh, and so on, they're starting to work those uh, assault areas, transportation areas, landing areas, and, and clearing the bombarding areas as well. So that's all going, that's all going well. And then 
as daylight comes, uh, the fleet sweepers start to turn back and they start widening those channels. And eventually the aim there, of course, is that that just becomes one mass of swept yeah. uh, through, that, through that barrier. And that, that operation actually takes 10 to 12 days, but that's interspersed with other commitments. Um, and, and that's it, that's, 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 that's D-Day. And, uh, but it's just, the, for the minesweepers, it's just the beginning. Uh, because all the really exciting stuff happens after D-Day. So just um, just to recap, in in the area that they were they were not certain about, it, it ended up not being quite as there was nothing there they 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 uh, they weren't expecting. No, no, the the German the main German mine barrier was uh, was weaker than expected. Uh, Good. Again, down to those reasons I outlined earlier, and Germans just not didn't have the level of sea control to able to be able to maintain a, a viable minefield there. Uh, and that's 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 my view of that. Uh, and then uh, the 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 Bay of Saint itself was not heavily mined at that point. And now we move on and top left picture there, uh, because this is D plus one, and this is where uh, this is where the mine battle really gets serious. Uh, this is uh, the American mine sweeper USS Tide, and she's just triggered a mine off uh, Utah. Um, on what's called the Cardinet Bank, uh, it's a, a, a shallow patch, uh, and uh, she sunk. Uh, and in the close proximity uh, to German, uh, to German destroyers, to American destroyers, are sunk. And uh, quite seriously, um, a big American um, uh, transport ship, ex liner, uh, the USS Susan B. Anthony. Uh, she's carrying nearly 3,000 men of the uh, 90th Infantry Division. Uh, she triggers a mine. She goes down. Uh, and they manage to get um, all, I think, 2,968, something like that. It's the, it's, it's the largest successful life-saving mission still in recorded history. Uh, but she's, she falls foul to a mine uh, on the same bank. And, and they quickly realize there are mines down there. There are influence mines down there. And there's immediate problem that uh, they've got to, they've got to deal with this. And of course, Carl, just to add my my local, the compounded by the fact the Germans still have the Krisbeck gun battery active yeah. uh, for, for a few days after D Day, which they'd hoped to neutralise with with the aerial bombardment, but it was under ten foot of concrete. So yeah, so the the Rich and the Meredith are the two destroyers, aren't they? That were that were lost there. So. Yeah. Um, mines and then fire from the coast as well. So when we're talking about the that, which is probably why the U.S. Navy monument is on Utah Beach rather than Omaha Beach. Although there was the problem, as you said, with the the the, the diving team is right on D Day, but the, the 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 real U.S. Navy drama was on the Utah Beach uh, sector for the for the first few days. Yeah, absolutely, and and, and this, this this caused a lot of casualties. And the immediate response, and and, and the Americans deal, dealt with it. And the Americans and the, the British sweepers, they, they all dealt with it. Um, we had a, a British uh, uh, senior officer mine sweepers uh, attached onto the staff of Admiral Kirk. And one of the immediate responses for that was that he was immediately given uh, command of, the, uh, of the, all the mine sweepers. Uh, so he had been there as an advisor, but he was immediately put into the role of senior officer, all mine sweepers for that area. But, but it was dealt with. But over 30 mines were located on this, uh, in this area. So that was a problem on D plus one. And then moving on, uh, on the night of uh, 7th or 8th of June, the, the Luftwaffe pays, pays a visit. And uh, we then discover we're really, really into a, a, a major attritional battle. So if we could just move on a, a slide here. And, uh, and, and the challenge is, uh, First of all, there's going to be a hell of a lot of aerial mine laying taking place every night now over the coming weeks. And, uh, and, the, and the, the real challenge of this is that the Germans have been keeping in reserve, although we suspected they might have something. They've got uh, a new kind of mine called the pressure mine, which you can see uh, top right. Uh, and this works on the pressure signature of the ship. And we just have no, no response to this. So... Um, Every uh, every night the Germans are coming over and uh, dropping these mines. We're talking about overall nearly a thousand mines are going to be swept in the Bay of Seine over the next two months. Uh, 70, 75% of them are influence mines. 
so these pressure mines are really, really going to cause us massive, massive problems. So the sweepers are in an attritional campaign now. Uh, they're sweeping all day. Uh, at night, the, uh, the fleet sweepers are going onto the flanks of the invasion area, uh, manning what's called the trout line against submarine or e-boats or unconventional aircraft attack, coming back into the lap. Um, the smaller the smaller minesweepers are um, are just watching for mines being laid at night, reporting that. So no one's get no one's getting any sleep, uh, and it's uh, it's quite an intense routine they're facing. Uh, almost overwhelming, you know. At one point, two, three weeks in, uh, they're having to uh, make the the channels are going to be smaller for the vessels using them. They're not getting wider; they get small, smaller because we're we're not able to keep them open. And the, uh, all the shipping going towards the beaches is going to have to travel at a lot slower speed because the only conceivable way we can beat the pressure line at the moment, and lots of measures are going to be tried, but it's just proceeding at slow speeds. So the operational tempo is, is going to change. So this is going on all the time. Um, so the, the sweepers are really not, not getting uh, much rest. A normal routine for them, they're going to be working seven to eight days uh, on live ops. They're going to take a day to go back to... Portsmouth, uh, probably sweeping on the way. Uh, a couple of days standoff in Portsmouth, getting fixed because the gear is taking a real pounding as well. The hulls are taking a real pounding from the mine detonations, uh, and then back in and, and doing the same, uh, and, and, and really, really, uh, really working hard. And, and the losses are accruing here. You know, we spoke about the, 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 the Susan Thomas, twenty uh, fourth of June, the forty third Rec reconnaissance regiment of the forty third Wessex Division. Uh, gets pretty much taken out when the uh, dairy winner gets mined um, and, and they're combating effective then uh, uh, for, for quite a while. Uh, I'm going to do a show on that at some point. There's a, I've got a lovely booklet about the, the sinking of that vessel. And I, I'm, at one point, I know I know a guy in um, in Southwest England who's who's next bit of an expert. And I want to do a show about that because it's just a fascinating little story. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I, and so that, that's, that has a major impact on, uh, of, on the 43rd Wessex Division. Obviously, you know, there are, there are battle reserves and whatever, but, but it's a big hit. Uh, Admiral Vian's flagship, uh, HMS Scylla, she gets, she gets taken out. She's a constructive total loss. And then we're losing, uh, we're losing minesweepers, either through uh, repeated pounding from explosions, uh, through mines, uh, writing them down. Uh, on the trap line itself, um, three of the uh, three of the Catherine class are lost to uh, what we'd call unconventional attack German uh, uh, human torpedoes uh, midget submarines take out the uh, the Cato the Pylades and the magic in, in, in just uh, less than a week we lose three of those so this is going on all the time and then um, towards the end of August off, off Le Havre um, we get a, a terrible blue on blue where uh, Royal Air Force typhoons, having been repeatedly assured there is no British shipping in the area, uh, they take out the halcyons of the first mine sweeping flotilla. They, they sink two of those halcyons, and the photo bottom right is uh, Asianus Britomart, um, with her, and she, she's not going to return to operations during the war uh, after that damage. Uh, mm. So, uh, so that's attritional when that goes on. So that really is. Uh, that's really the the fight for attrition, the fight to keep the uh, to keep the beachhead open, to keep the res resupply coming in, and uh, as you can see there, you know, the, a huge number of mines, nearly nearly a thousand mines, uh, and there are, speaking frankly, Paul, there are still some down there, quite frankly. Uh, we, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, it's, it, it's still uh, still being uh, still being disclosed, um, and I think the. the Mines account for any more than any other uh, form of uh, German attack during that campaign, uh, and in all, we're going to lose 50 major warships, 25 minor warships, and um, I think uh, 25 to 30 merchant vessels, and, and most of them due to the mine. Uh, over I the, think, it's, uh, I think the including landing craft, it's something like 900 Allied ships lost in the Bay of Seine. There, there was that documentary a few years ago where they kind of removed the ocean digitally and showed all the wrecks yeah, that they yeah. discovered. It was 900 or 900 plus, if I recall. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. So, so two, two, two points I want to make to you, Nick. One, one is, um, as someone who understands the, the mine sweeping and the, the, the laying by the Luftwaffe of these mines all through June, July, does it annoy you, therefore, when you see documentaries or books, when they talk about the Allied air superiority supremacy? Because it's 
these words get bandied about and, and, and used um, interchangeably. And, um, you know, the argument that most people would make is we had superiority, but we didn't have supremacy because if, if the Luftwaffe are dropping night, uh, mines on a nightly basis, then we don't completely control the skies. We, we, we have a lot of influence in the skies, but does that annoy you when you read that? Uh, I, don't, I don't get too wound up about that. I, I don't even get... No, I, it, 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 it was just a fact of life. I, I, at that stage in the war, I, I, you don't have the ability to... Uh, I don't think we have the ability to have air supremacy at night. I know it just, it's just not possible. Yeah, but and it is, you would agree, it is something that's said. You see that being yeah. said, that we have complete air yeah. supremacy. And it's, it's like, you know, you're, you're mixing up two words there. And, uh, you know, the Luftwaffe is not is not out of the war by any stretch of the imagination yet. Forget about just the sea element of them, but the, the, Luft, the, the, night, the, the night fighters, the, the attacks on uh, ground positions overnight. I mean, it's, I, it annoys me when I hear that people say, oh, the Luftwaffe were no threat anymore. I go, well, yes, they were. You're not reading the right books. And the second thing I want to make, because Joe Belkowski, the American historian, wrote about Omaha Beach and 29th Division. He asked right at the beginning of the show, he asked you to comment on the German pressure mines because he's saying, is it... Well, clearly it is, but it, it's a vital fact that the Germans didn't get those pressure mines in the channel before Neptune. They only yeah. got them. And what, you know, what if they had got them, managed to get pressure mines there before um, the operation starts? Is is that potentially a game changer? It, I think it could well have been. I, I but the, you know, I mean, it's always I mean, counterfactuals. Are, are, are yeah, of course. And the, the, they held them back for a specific reason, um, because. You know, they they they'd blown it with the magnetic and acoustic mines so quickly, and we developed countermeasures so quickly. Uh, my reading of it is that Hitler actually expressly forbade, forbade the use of pressure mines until after the invasion, on the basis that we're going to lay them, the Brits are going to find them, they're very good at, at working out how these things work, and they're going to have an effective uh, effective countermeasure uh, before we can take advantage of it. So they've got around 2,000 of these pressure mines uh, stocked up near airfields around Le Mans, I think. And they were specifically holding them back. They had a specific re rationale for, for not deploying them. I mean, if, if, if they'd used them, uh, if, they, if they'd been there on D-Day itself, yeah, it, it, could, it could have wreaked havoc. But yeah, it's wow. good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. You're right. The counterfactual argument is always a rabbit hole that you disappear down that you can't get out of. But it is just, it's important to just stop and consider and think, think about the, the wider picture there. And um, yeah, so let, yeah, that, this was you know, your next slide. The, the, the Admiral Kirk quote that you mentioned earlier on. I, I'd like you to kind of just, well, I'll, I'll, I'll read it. I'll, I'll have a go. So it can be said without fear of contradiction that minesweeping was the keystone in the arch of this operation. The performance of the minesweepers could only be described as magnificent. And yeah, it's, it kind of says everything you've been saying, really. And and it's it's, I think that the the overwhelming comments that we're getting tonight is people, as we thought, are realizing there was a hell of a lot more involved in this operation than the one paragraph it usually gets in most of the books and most of the discussions about it. And so yeah, it's it's food for thought, I think. Yeah, I I think the only the only uh, the only three words missing from that quote, which the Royal Navy and uh, Royal Naval Patrol Service, who were manning the auxiliaries, uh, would want to see, would be the words "splice the main brace." I, I can't see those there. But, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's, it's it's a good recognition of what was achieved. I uh, I don't want to overbig the mine sweeping. You know, and the, the for me, you know, if, if you're going to talk center of gravity or, or if you count at that level, and the landing craft, the landing ships were for me were, were it but i'm clearly without the enabling of the uh of the uh of the sweepers it, it, you just wouldn't have been able to uh build up a temp you, know, you wouldn't have been able to journey i think it was montgomery yeah. he wasn't worried about what happened on d-day he was concerned about the battle of the builder wasn't he and he he was yeah. looking and his focus was not on getting on the beaches it was how quickly could he get his forces into that beachhead such that when the german counterattacks came he was ready and um and uh, I think I think it was there that the minesweepers really uh, it would have been glued up if it hadn't been for the minesweepers. 
Uh, I think the, the, the tendency is is that when you when there's a when there's something that hasn't been discussed much, such as tonight we're talking about mine mine sweeping and mine clearing operations, is therefore for a sensationalist thing. This is the most important aspect of innovation. You could say you could make that claim about anything. You could make it about aerial photography or the knocking out the radar or the intelligence operations or any other. The, the ultimate point is they all work in conjunction. It's the, it's the old cliche of this chain being as, as only as strong as the weakest link. And all of these operations, you know, the training of the troops to assault out of those landing craft, the preparation by the SOE, by the resistance. There was a big discussion on Twitter yesterday about just exactly how effective what the, was the French resistance in stopping the German reinforcements get to Normandy. You go, well, it was of some importance. No one's saying it's the only thing. No one's saying the whole war turned on that one thing but the fact remains the das reich division were delayed by resistance activity going to normandy whether it's a two days or one day it doesn't it doesn't matter you have to look at these things in connection all of them together and the mine sweeping operation is one of those very important aspects no more important no less important than lots of others and it's about giving all of them a fair a fair crack of the whip and understanding it all works in in, in conjunction that's what i think so um What's what's the future in terms of studying of the mine sweeping operations? Is there elements that haven't been done, Nick? Is there more work to be done on this subject? What you know? How are the archives? What where where are you or where is where are people at in the study of this? Um, it's 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 just not one of those subjects that attracts a lot of attention. So I'm I'm delighted Jack's working on it, and uh, uh, Rob Rob Hall uh, does a lot. Uh, he's part of the the Vernon team. Uh, uh, on that, and he's, he's a, good, uh, a good friend of mine, but it, it, it's not an area that gets a lot of attention. I, I've sort of got various ideas about, you know, do I want to take this forward, and do I want to, you know, where do I want to go on that? And one for me, I, I, I do want to look a lot more at the uh, the Battle of the Scheldt, uh, mm. uh, a maritime campaign, and the uh, the complexity of the minesweep on operation to get up the Scheldt to Antwerp, because of course we'd got Antwerp weeks and weeks be before we could before we could use it. Uh, that is a really, really interesting uh, mine-sweeping operation. So I think I'm going to look at that. Uh, but I, I'll keep running. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be busy up until August 2025 on, on running the, uh, the, uh, my Twitter account uh, at Sweepers3945 because that's, that's the day-by-day -day battle. But I'm, uh, I'm, I'm possibly looking to, to have a bit more output. I'm conscious, I'm conscious I didn't answer the first question that I was posed today, the difference between mine-sweeping and mine-hunting. I didn't mention mine hunting at all because mine hunting was a technique developed almost specifically later for the pressure mine. It's where you use a sonar ahead of the uh, uh, ahead of your uh, mine countermeasures vessel to locate a mine on the on the seabed, and you, then you deploy divers or charge. Uh, I see. So sweeping is finding and removing. Hunting is just finding for another means of removal beyond. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And well, this is. This has been, yeah, I mean, and, and I feel, again, there's more there's more we can do. And, and Dr. Phil Weir suggested we should do something about um, mine sweeping in the 1940 May Dunkirk Dynamo kind of area, which is worth doing. David O'Keefe is probably going to say we should do something about expanding on the EP side of things. The shelled estuary is, so every time I do something on the shelled estuary, I realise that's an, an, an untalked about campaign generally. The ground operations commandos, engineers, um, uh, the, the yeah there's there's so many potential avenues we could progress down but right now i think i'm gonna just remind the viewers what we've got coming up tomorrow and i'll come back and say goodbye to you because it's been it's been extraordinary but then well there we are folks that i've learned a lot about mine sweeping um and i'm sure you have too we have one final show in the build-up to d-day week which is tomorrow night which is matt bone another regular joining us to talk about RAF and he may have a point to about the typhoon blue on blue instant kind of defending it or justifying it or something because he's a bit of a typhoon nut but we'll talk about that tomorrow and that connects with what we did today it'll connect with the aerial reconnaissance thing and it'll connect with the whole kind of security and intelligence aspect of which that'll be good and then i've got the weekend off although i'm going out doing a filming and then we all get into leadership week leadership week incredible dr phil blood will be on peter caddick adams we're talking um, uh, uh, Monty, uh, a pattern, uh, all sorts of things there. And then we get into D-Day itself, but lots of exciting live streams. The one I've just confirmed today on June the 6th, on the morning, um, we are going to be beaming to you live from Sword Beach for a talk about the South Lanks 
hitting Hermanville, which will be really cool. So that will be quite good for the Americans, because if people Americans stay up late on the night of June the 5th, they will still be up to see me on the or us on the beach on Saw Beach on June the 6th. It'll be quite cool. So that's all coming up soon. As usual, don't forget, check out our Twitter account, Facebook, the website, consider becoming a patron. Definitely check out Nick's Mind Sweeping Twitter account. Lots of information on there about mind sweeping, as you would imagine. Uh, but right now, it means me to say thank you very much, Nick Stanley, for, for that incredible okay. presentation. Tonight. And I think we will definitely invite you back again to expand on your knowledge in either another theater, Mediterranean or something. Uh, there's lots of there's lots of avenues we go down. But anyway, have you enjoyed it? I've really enjoyed it. So thank you very much indeed. It's, it's been a pleasure and an honor. Well, yeah, it's the honor is all ours. So there we are, folks. That's the end of tonight's show. I will see you all tomorrow for Radar and Typhoon. So this is Paul Woodhead for World War II TV. See you all tomorrow. <laughs>